Fructose metabolism is important because it converts dietary monosaccharide fructose into a substrate for glycolysis and energy production. As you can see in our zoomed out metabolism diagram, fructose enters glycolysis partway through the pathway. Normally it's converted to fructose 1-phosphate by fructokinase in the liver. The enzyme aldolase B then converts fructose 1-phosphate to dihydroxyacetone phosphate in glyceraldehyde. Triose kinase can then combine these two to make glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is one of the substrates in glycolysis. Essential fructoseria is an autosomal recessive defect in fructokinase. Now fructokinase is the enzyme that phosphorylates fructose after it enters the cell, and it's this phosphorylation that prevents the fructose from leaving the cell. Therefore, without this enzyme, there's nothing keeping fructose in the cell, so it just washes out in the urine. Therefore, this is a benign asymptomatic condition. However, fructose intolerance is a more serious autosomal recessive disorder of aldolase B. Without aldolase B, fructose 1-phosphate accumulates, and since it's already phosphorylated, it can't leave the cell. This consumes a lot of the available phosphate, which inhibits gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, and therefore causes hypoglycemia, since you can't make more glucose or release stored glucose. Patients will also have jaundice, cirrhosis, and vomiting due to the toxic accumulation of fructose 1-phosphate in the liver. The treatment for this is not to eat fructose or sucrose, since sucrose is a disaccharide composed of glucose and fructose. In general, disorders of galactose metabolism are more serious. In galactose metabolism, galactose is converted into glucose, so it can be used in glycolysis. This mostly takes place in the liver, but other tissues also metabolize galactose to a lesser extent. Normally, dietary lactose is broken down into galactose and glucose. Galactose is then phosphorylated by galactokinase to galactose 1-phosphate, which is converted by uridyl transferase to glucose 1-phosphate. This can be converted to glucose 6-phosphate, which can be used to start glycolysis or finish gluconeogenesis, depending on energy needs. Galactokinase deficiency is an autosomal recessive deficiency of galactokinase. This prevents the phosphorylation of galactose, and instead causes it to be converted into an alcohol form, galactitol. This is catalyzed by the enzyme aldose reductase, which, as I'll discuss in the next slide, also converts glucose to sorbitol. This is usually a mild condition, but galactitol does accumulate inside cells and can cause galactosemia, infantile cataracts, and failure to track objects or develop a social smile. Classic galactosemia is a more serious autosomal recessive deficiency of galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. This causes both galactose 1-phosphate and galactitol to accumulate inside cells, so it causes some of the same effects as galactokinase deficiency, such as the infantile cataracts, as well as some new ones due to the galactose 1-phosphate accumulation, such as jaundice and hepatomegaly. These are similar to what you see in fructose intolerance, since in both cases you're accumulating a phosphorylated monosaccharide inside hepatocytes and causing liver damage. The treatment is also similar. Don't eat anything with galactose or lactose, since lactose is a disaccharide composed of galactose and glucose. Sorbitol, which is shown here, is basically a reduced alcohol form of glucose, which is formed by the enzyme aldose reductase. This should sound familiar, since this also converts galactose to galactitol, as I mentioned on the last slide. Sorbitol is formed to trap glucose inside cells, and can later be converted to fructose by sorbitol dehydrogenase. However, if a tissue lacks sorbitol dehydrogenase, toxic levels of sorbitol can accumulate, which causes damage because it's osmotically active and pulls water in. In states of persistent hyperglycemia, such as in diabetes, high sorbitol can cause damage to the lens, the retina, the kidneys, and Schwann cells, since these all have only aldose reductase and not sorbitol dehydrogenase. This can cause cataracts, retinopathy, peripheral neuropathy, and glomerular disease. As I mentioned before, galactosemia can also result in the conversion to osmotically active alcohol forms of galactose via aldose reductase. Lactase is a brush border enzyme in the small intestine, which hydrolyzes the disaccharide lactose to its constituents, glucose and galactose. Deficiency in this enzyme can be either hereditary, age-dependent, or transient, following gastroenteritis. Symptoms of lactase deficiency and subsequent lactose intolerance include bloating, cramps, and osmotic diarrhea, because lactose will not be absorbed and therefore will pull water into the GI tract due to the osmotic gradient it creates. Treatment includes avoiding lactose in the diet or taking lactase pills. So far, we've covered topics about the metabolism of nucleic acids and carbohydrates. Now we'll move into proteins and their building blocks amino acids. Only the L form of amino acids are found in proteins. They can be categorized by whether they're essential or non-essential, and if they're acidic, basic, or neutral. The essential amino acids have to be supplied in the diet, since humans can't produce them. The glucogenic essential amino acids, which can be converted to glucose via gluconeogenesis in the liver, are methionine, valine, arginine, and histidine. There are many more non-essential glucogenic amino acids, and the reason they're glucogenic is because they can be used to make either pyruvate or one of the TCA cycle intermediates. The purely ketogenic amino acids, which can be converted to ketone bodies, are leucine and lysine. 
The essential amino acids that can be converted to either glucose or ketones are isoleucine, phenylalanine, threonine, and tryptophan. The acidic amino acids, which have a negative charge of physiologic pH, are aspartate and glutamate. The basic amino acids, which are positively charged of physiologic pH, are arginine, lysine, and histidine. Arginine is the most basic, and histidine does not actually have a positive charge of physiologic pH. Since DNA is negatively charged, histones use the positively charged or basic amino acids to attract and hold on to it. Interestingly, the only basic amino acid that sounds like histone, which is histine, is the only one that's not really used for this purpose. Alright, so we just talked about different kinds of amino acids, now let's go through how they're broken down. Different amino acids go through different catabolic processes, many of which yield metabolic fuel in the form of pyruvate or acetyl-CoA, and ultimately glucose and ketone bodies. They all produce ammonium, though, and if this isn't disposed of properly, it can cause disease. Urea is the non-toxic, disposable form of ammonium, which is synthesized in the liver and excreted by the kidneys. This accounts for about 90% of all nitrogen excreted in the urine. The reactants for the urea cycle are carbon dioxide and ammonia, and the products are urea and fumarate. If you take a look at the mass for metabolism diagram, you'll notice that fumarate feeds back into the TCA cycle. It's also important to note that the urea cycle takes place in both the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. The rate limiting step is the first one, which is catalyzed by carbon phosphate synthetase 1. This enzyme converts carbon dioxide and ammonium to carbon phosphate. This may sound familiar, since I talked about it at the beginning of the biochemistry chapter. Carbon phosphate synthetase 2 creates carbon phosphate in pyrimidine synthesis. A mnemonic that can help you remember the rest of this cycle is ordinarily, careless crappers are also frivolous about urination, which stands for ornithine, carbon phosphate, citrulline, aspartate, arginosuccinate, fumarate, arginine, and urea. It's also important to know that this process requires 2 ATP. As I mentioned before, ammonium is a toxic molecule that must be converted to urea so it can be excreted in the urine. However, the urea cycle only occurs in the liver, which means that ammonia must be transported to the liver first. This transport occurs in the form of alanine, which is shown here. In the muscle, the amine group that you're trying to dispose of is added to alpha-ketoglutarate in a transamination reaction, which results in glutamate. By the way, this is the same alpha-ketoglutarate we talked about in the TCA cycle. In a second transamination reaction, this amine group is transferred to pyruvate, which forms alanine. This is catalyzed by alanine aminotransferase, or ALT. Alanine can then circulate through the blood, and then enter the liver. Here, the previous reaction is reversed, and the amine group is transferred from alanine to alpha-ketoglutarate to form glutamate. In the final step, the ammonium from glutamate enters the urea cycle and is used to make urea. This also allows glutamate to cycle back and form alpha-ketoglutarate. Alright, so what happens if you have too much ammonia, or in other words, you're producing it faster than you can get rid of it? Excess ammonia is a serious medical condition that causes hepatic encephalopathy. These patients will have symptoms such as tremor, slurring speech, somnolence, vomiting, and blurry vision, and it can also be deadly due to cerebral edema. Hyperammonemia can be caused by liver disease, since that's where ammonia is broken down into urea, or can be caused by a genetic deficiency in the urea cycle enzyme, which prevents the urea cycle from working properly. In either case, ammonia will build up and will be transferred to alpha-ketoglutarate, which causes it to form glutamate and therefore takes it out of the TCI cycle. The treatment of this condition is to limit protein in the diet and to administer amino acid binders such as benzoate or phenylbutyrate, which will increase the excretion of ammonia. You can also give lactulose to acidify the GI tract, which traps ammonia so that it can be excreted rather than absorbed. Speaking of hereditary urea cycle enzyme deficiencies, ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency is the most common urea cycle disorder. A lot of enzyme deficiencies I've mentioned are autosomal recessive, but this one is actually X-linked recessive. Remember, ornithine transcarbamylase is used to convert ornithine to citrulline by adding carbon oil phosphate. Therefore, if this enzyme is deficient, carbon oil phosphate builds up. The excess carbon oil phosphate will be converted to erotic acid in the pyrimidine synthesis pathway. So manifestations of ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency include erotic acid in the blood and urine, decreased BUN, since urea can't be formed without this enzyme, and the symptoms of hyperammonemia that I talked about in the last slide, since ammonia can't be converted to urea. You'll also see high erotic acid in the urine and erotic aciduria, which is caused by defect in one of the enzymes that converts erotic acid to UMP. But do you remember how you can differentiate between the two? Erotic aciduria won't have hyperammonemia, since you can still break down ammonia just fine. 